welcome all to the session on building a path to net zero aviation in association with the World Economic Forum Clean Skies for Tomorrow initiative. This is a two-part session with a public live stream, that's what we're doing right now, followed by a second half, which is a private session for forum members and partners to have the opportunity to interact directly with the panelists. I wanna take you on my journey. I've been lucky enough to work with the development of sustainable aviation fuels throughout my career. In fact, I started working on sustainable aviation fuels when people said there was no way that we would ever be able to fly a commercial plane on a drop-in replacement, bio-derived or alternative-derived fuel. And here we are 15 years later, there are seven certified drop-in sustainable aviation fuel pathways, and we've completed more than 300,000 commercial flights. While that seems like a drop in the bucket, the reality is it's no longer a question of if we can do this, but rather how quickly we can do it. How quickly can we come to the point where sustainable aviation fuels are on every plane that we get on? And to achieve this, we're going to need tremendous collaboration because as you know, our climate emergency dictates that we need to do this faster and faster. So we need collaboration like the World Economic Forum, Clean Skies for Tomorrow, IATA and the Jet Zero Council, as well as all the businesses and governments and the airlines that are represented here today. What I'm most excited about is to see this tremendous interest in what we call scope three emissions which is basically bringing in all the brands and the large businesses to the table. Over the course of this session, we will focus on challenges and priorities across the aviation value chain, trying to drive this energy transition and highlighting the commitments that will be necessary to create an equitable path forward for a net zero aviation. So with that, let me introduce the wonderful lineup that we have today. We have Dr. Fang Lu, the Secretary General of the International Civil Aviation Organization, Mr. Dink, Dick Benshop, Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Shippel Group, Ms. Gracia Vitadeni, Chief Technology Officer of Airbus, and the Right Honorable Grant Shapps, Secretary of State for Transport, Department for Transport of the United Kingdom, joining us today. So if I may, what I'd like to do is, in the order that I've just presented them, ask each of our presenters to spend a couple of minutes giving us their perspective on what we are doing now. Let me start with Dr. Fang Liu, please. Thank you, Jennifer, for our wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I will start with a uh, quote the UN Secretary General Guterres um, in his uh, recent um, uh, statement. He's saying, build a sustainable system driven by renewable energy, green jobs, and a reliable future. As IQ Secretary General, I'm greatly encouraged that governments and the air transport industry have both the motivation and the opportunity to answer that call. As you rightly said, this journey needs everyone's participation. And during the recent events uh, organized by IQ, in the areas of innovation and environment. Stakeholders from around the world arrive with strong commitments, ambitious roadmaps, and dozens of exciting new climate solutions. Tremendous innovations in hybrid, electric, and hydrogen proportion were discussed recent exponent advances 
in battery energy density and increased sustainable aviation fuels deployment were appreciated and a common call was heard on the need to accelerate the pace at which we identify, assess, and regulate these advances to the benefit of all. Today's innovations, however, represent some very significant aviation paradigm shifts. And they are also heavily relying on new investments, incentives, and partnerships being attracted and realized. As you know, ACAO is United Nations Specialized Agency and setting uh, international standards for aviation and assist the member states to implement these uh, uh, standards. And we already established uh, uh, COSIA uh, international standards for the aviation and are working on the other guidance and materials for implementation. And we are very happy that uh, the COSIA uh, um, standards has been started for implementation as of January 1st of this year and according to our uh, regulations and also our assembly resolutions. So IQ is where many of these participants happen and we will continue to drive progress in all areas of aviation sustainability. We will also work to help enable and not stiff the paradigms shifts now and away while ensuring mm. throughout this coming evolution that our sector's overall sustainability is appreciated based on the many social, environment, and economic factors which comprise it, but not only based on the annual emissions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your remarks. Uh, I would like to now proceed to Mr. Dick Benshaw, please. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. And uh, thanks for uh, inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, conversation. Um, perhaps strange because aviation is in the deepest crisis uh, of its existence, but uh, I want to highlight at the start of the discussion three positive developments I see around sustainability. The first one is around commitments. Uh, which is like the starting point. Um, and I see that uh, the aviation sector, the airports, uh, the airlines are now really coming together around the commitment uh, towards net zero aviation uh, in 2050. So in line uh, with the Paris uh, Agreement. And I think those are important uh, steps. Secondly, uh, if you think about the first 10 years towards 2030, there's a heavy burden on the introduction, the scaling up of sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and it's, it's good to see that we are now getting beyond the first pilots, that really um, factories, plants are being built and developed, whether it's in Singapore or in the UK or in the Netherlands, uh, which will be at full scale and, and using various technologies, but getting those sustainable aviation fuels towards uh, the market. And it's positive as well. I believe that we see um, all kinds of fuel players acting in this space. So it's not just companies like yourselves, uh, um, uh, Jennifer and, and Sky Energy and other dedicated companies, but you see the big fuel players um, moving into this uh, area as well. Um, BP, Shell, uh, Uniper, um, and Neste and others. Uh, so there's now serious investment uh, on the table um, um, to get us beyond this phase of demonstration projects. And the third element, and at least it's taking shape in Europe, and I hope that will be an example elsewhere, is that to get to scale, to get further than even the first set of, uh, of plants, uh, you need really policies uh, in place and regulation in place to solve the chicken and egg issue between supply and demand. Um, and um, Europe is now on the on the verge of announcing its refuel aviation initiative, as I believe it's called, uh, which will introduce a uh, a blending mandate uh, for sustainable aviation fuels, uh, and that would be an enormous step uh, forward. And I think it would be an enormous investment uh, to further uh, investment uh, by the private uh, sector. 
So there's a lot, a lot still to be done, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. But I would like to kick us off with uh, with those three positive uh, developments around uh, around commitment, around private investment, and around public policy on sustainable aviation fuels. That uh, that that is that is getting started now. Thank you, Dick. It's it's amazing how important your role and that of airports has been. You've been one of the leaders from the beginning, and so we thank you for being here and for your remarks. Uh, I would like now to turn to uh, Ms. Bittadini, who will go ahead and give us her viewpoints on this topic. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Yes, it's a great pleasure to be among all of you and really a an honor to be back at Davos, albeit in 2D um, this time. Allow me a moment of uh, nostalgia. It was, you know, just last January, I participated in a WEF session on clean skies of tomorrow. And during the session, you know, where we're discussing about the challenge of balancing our commitment to developing sustainable technologies to decarbonize air travel with the uh, growing passenger and aircraft demand at the time. Well, these days, the question I get asked most highlights um, a quite different paradox. So is aviation still committed to net zero or will it focus rather on recovering profitability first? Well, let me be crystal clear. This is a false choice. At Airbus, we have accelerated our ambition to fly carbon neutral into a really tangible plan to bring a zero emission aircraft to market by 2035. But while we recognize that developing a climate neutral aircraft is maybe the most direct contribution that we can bring uh, as a manufacturer, well, the challenge of climate change goes well beyond one single entity. And this week, we've seen leaders such as President von der Leyen, Chancellor Merkel, President Moon Jae-in reiterate that multilateralism and cross-industry unity is the common denominator to stimulating a really sustainable and long-term recovery. And to this extent, I'm really pleased to see at least some beacons of optimism. So we've seen the 13 airlines of one world coming together to pledge net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And the SAF partnership on sustainable aviation fuels between Microsoft and Alaska Airlines. We clearly have the right level of ambition in my view and science driven targets. Now we need to progress on the regulatory frameworks on public policy support and on robust and safe technology pathways to get us there. So I do applaud the World Economic Forum for reorienting all industries towards our collective goal. And I certainly do look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Gracia. I really appreciate your remarks, especially a view that false choices uh, are, are the wrong way to think about things. We're way smarter than false choices, and I appreciate your comments on that. Um, next, I would like to call on the Right Honorable Grant Shapps to give us his views and perspectives. Jennifer, thanks very much and good afternoon to everyone. I have to say it's a real pleasure to be invited to uh, join you today. I wish it was in happier times. Uh, I wish it was in happier times for aviation in particular. I think as we approach the first anniversary of the COVID outbreak, there's no doubt that the pandemic has hit this industry harder than probably any other. And like many governments, we've been working flat out throughout 2020 and now into 2021 as well to work out how to support the airline and airport sector. But it's been an incredibly tough year. Uh, but I think now, finally, with vaccinations taking place uh, at a uh, increasing pace. We're up to 7 million in the UK. We're vaccinating at over 2 million uh, a week. We now see a route to the recovery. And our ac economic plan is to, uh, as the saying goes, to build back better. And absolutely fundamental to that plan is to decarbonize in aviation, making flights cleaner and greener, 
so the sector can grow in a sustainable and resilient way. And as others have said, it's a process that had already started well before coronavirus, but I consider it to be more important than ever as we come out, that we pursue it even more actively. So the UK was um, the first major economy in the world to set a legally binding target to get to net zero uh, by 2050. That means net zero in all carbon emissions, and it means we need to sort out aviation. And within the aviation sector, uh, we've launched what uh, we've called the Jet Zero Council. And of course, governments can't tackle the issue alone, uh, and that's why we're working really closely uh, with industry. Last summer, uh, I co-chaired the first meeting, and then have continued since then, of the Jet Zero Council. And that's with leaders from government, from aviation, from aerospace, and of course, from academia. And our single overriding goal is to make net zero a possibility in aviation and to do so well before 2050. But even more importantly, a collaboration, as Grazia and others have said, is going to be required to work uh, if we're going to make this happen. And that means working at a global level to decarbonize the sector. And that's why we're now working through ICAO uh, to set global net zero long term goals and standards for aviation emissions. And that's why I'm looking forward to our hosting COP26 in the UK in Glasgow in nine months time. And we want to use COP26 to help accelerate the transition to cleaner aviation. So we're going to be working with the World Economic Forum, with other states to develop new policy tools, which will help drive the deployment of sustainable aviation fuels. And for the summit itself, we're seeking to arrange provision for sustainable aviation fuels for delegates at key UK airports. And we're going to be encouraging others to do the same across the world. So, Jennifer, I'm absolutely delighted to be here at this event. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Thank you so much. Um, the emphasis on collaboration, especially as you set the stage for the master collaboration of COP26, um, really uh, is a clear path forward. So thank you very much for your remarks. I'm going to now go through and and provide some questions to the, to the panelists. Um, and I'm going to start by asking Dick, which public policies do you see as being important in driving aviation and creating a sustainable transition? And if there was a framework or other policies that you'd like to see set forth and prioritize, we'd like to hear your views on that as well. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think it's, it's, it's a key question eh? because we, we have to get policies right and regulation right in order to, to provide the right incentives to get investment going and then we are going to make uh, the transition in uh, indeed. And, uh, and, and I'm positive about certain planks of it that are coming into place. Uh, for example, uh, the focus now on, on sustainable aviation fuel, the European mandate uh, to be uh, developed uh, in uh, indeed. Um, but at the same time, uh, you see that there's still what I would say almost a bit of a scattergun approach to, uh, to policy as far as aviation and sustainability is, is concerned. You see a, a, a lot of things that are are being done and are being tried, but not really effective at the moment. Um, and we need we need to to focus. Um, and and there's really two areas to focus on, or three areas to focus on. Of course, the one in one is general um, emission trading, emission pricing schemes like that uh, that help to uh, to get the right incentives, uh, both to to the sector as well as to consumers. Secondly, then, then take a tackling the, the real big issue of, of the aviation fuels through mandates. And then thirdly, how to support um, um, research and development into new propulsion as well. And this, this age of electric flying or hydrogen flying that will, that, that will come. Um, but we see a lot of, of other attempts or a lot of other discussion as well. Uh, aviation tech, taxes, uh, ticket taxes, um, which are not really helpful uh, because yes, they add cost, but they don't drive greening and they don't drive sustainability. And for that sector, which is indeed in its biggest crisis and is one of the hardest hit sectors, we have to be very focused. Yes, we are going to add cost because sustainability 
will have it cost. It will have enormous benefits as well, but it will have cost. Investments have to take place. And in order to do that, we have to focus on those measures, on those policies that drive the right incentives, that drive the right investments. And um, in a way, there's not enough international coordination in this sense. And, and there's um, strands of policy making, especially around taxation, um, which do not drive us in the right direction and which are a distraction. And it, it's almost, it feels like we are not serious enough then in terms of tackling this, this big issue. So let's focus um, and, um, and, and, and take the right measures and not get diverted as we are currently uh, uh, to a too large uh, extent. Thank you, Dick. Really appreciate your remarks. And actually, that leads me directly then to a question for Dr. Liu. You talk about cost and pricing and the importance of thinking about costs differently. And, and I think Ikeo has been thinking about this for quite a, a long time and trying to set a forward view. Can you talk a little bit about policies and, and how to ensure um, so we pay more for sustainability, but that we appreciate and understand that that is what needs to happen. Can you can you share Ikeo's perspective on that? Yeah, like uh, um, everyone knows, um, this COVID-19 uh, is a great challenge for the aviation sector, but also provide an uh, enormous opportunity as well for our sector to build it back better in, in terms of greener aviation, and also to um, to meet our uh, aspirational goals, which are under discussion, and uh, by 2050 zero uh, net uh, emission. So um, as you can see, uh, the airlines already started to uh, think about, it, and also some of them already take action to retire some um, a few extensive uh, aircrafts and to purchase uh, greener and more efficient and fuel efficient aircraft to modernize that fleet. That is one of the, these kind of the measures. And then also more important is government and also uh, private sector as well should work together like uh, WEF provide this kind of opportunity to have the public sector and the private sector to work together to develop the common paths to move further. And then from Acure's side, as uh, you uh, already know, we are now in the process to, de to developing our uh, framework leading uh, to um, the 25th aspirational goal uh, framework, uh, which will be considered in 2022. And it, starting from this year and the next year, there are numbers of this kind of uh, webinars and also seminars and the food, uh, uh, all, all the stakeholders to come over to share their best practices and share their innovative solutions uh, in order for our sector to move further. And the, one of the most important uh, thing I want to emphasize that aviation is a global uh, business. We have a global network. We need the global solutions. And that is uh, through ICAO, we build this global solution, which can help to address this issue by joint efforts across the world, which can benefit to everyone. And then not only, I would also emphasize, not only government and also companies, I think individual, you also play an important role. Because the individual is also the passenger base for airlines. And let's say if you are going to travel to one destination, there is options for you to take. Either you take a big aircraft to the busiest air, airports and with uh, more uh, emissions, but uh, there is another option. There is uh, uh, electrical and a smaller airport aircraft and uh, to the local airports and then with less emission. So also passenger can make a choice, which also can help uh, the airlines and manufacturers and also government to work for this common objective. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. And that actually gives us a perfect opportunity 
to, to go to uh, Gracia, who can maybe tell us a little bit about what the OEMs are doing. We talk about hydrogen, we talk about SAF, we talk about electric vehicles. How do these things come together in creating a more sustainable path to net zero? Yes, Jennifer, I think it's important to, to underline, first of all, that already uh, well before the crisis, it was a widely accepted view that preserving our climate and environment is the indispensable foundation upon which to build the, the longer term future of aviation, both ecologically and economically, societally and politically. And we did see early and quite veritable signs of this, you know, when the EU declared a climate emergency and, and outlined very ambitious plans for a European Green Deal. We heard uh, Larry Fink announcing plans to make sustainability his new global investment standard. And I mean, last year at the West, the climate protection movement um, did very positively dominate the agenda. So based on these uh, signals, you know, one could say that the pandemic has increased global understanding of how dependent we are on our environment. And it's become quite clear that any significant industry recovery and profit in the years to come will depend on um, ambitious climate protection plans in parallel. And again, from you know the Airbus perspective, we have accelerated our decarbonization ambition into a tangible plan to bring a zero emission aircraft to market by 20. 35, we've rolled out uh, Zero E, a three aircraft concept, all relying on hydrogen as, as primary power source, exploring different technology pathways, different architectures. And this is really a crucial element of how we plan to contribute to the decarbonization of our industry. That being said, um, another key implication for the industry, especially in Europe, is finding a balanced way forward for alternative fuels and solutions. And in this respect, I see absolutely three priorities. Um, first of all, the need to boost production and uptake of sustainable aviation fuels. And to do that, we're going to need a dedicated and uh, stable, robust set of policy measures throughout um, you know, legislation and financing. Uh, six of my industry, CTO Pierce and I, signed a letter soliciting ICAO's indispensable support and action on, on SAFs, um, which really underpins the importance um, of this joint industrial commitment. We're also working on other SAF initiatives with our colleagues at Safran, at Rolls-Royce, and we're really excited about that. Um, more specifically, I really believe this policy should include prioritization of sustainable fuels for aviation, investing into developing high impact feedstock and conversion technologies and cost effective financing because SAF provide a short and long-term solution to decarbonizing the sector. Uh, while technology in parallel continues to evolve to achieve even more fuel efficient aircraft than today. And it also plays a key role in industry-wide carbon reduction as all existing aircraft can already safely fly on a SAF blend up to 50%, we've certified that. Second priority, implementing a green stimulus for airlines to enable um, them retiring um, old and less environmentally friendly aircraft. You know, replacing a single aer aircraft can save more than 4,500 tons of CO2 per year. And if you consider long range aircraft, well, that saving goes up to 37,000 tons per year. So really creating the right conditions, the right financing framework to allow airlines to modernize their fleets towards more fuel efficient aircraft is a win-win and it would support absolutely the European green agenda. Third and last point, we need to catalyze um, an industry collaboration unlike any we've seen in recent history 
really joining forces with all stakeholders across the industry, across the political arena and research institutions. It's absolutely important to note that as with every, every new technology or innovation rollout, a global transition to zero emission flight requires a total rethink of many elements of our quite intricate uh, aviation ecosystem. You mentioned hydrogen, take hydrogen. Um, we're gonna need to see a technical redesign of current aircraft. So engineers will need to take the technologies developed in automotive and space, bringing the weight and the cost down and making really the technology safe and compatible with commercial aircraft operations. And we're gonna need to mo mobilize, of course, Airbus air airport infrastructure, right? We've, we've started working with several airports, including Schiphol and airlines, um, working on the concept of a airport hydrogen hub. And of course, we're gonna need the collaboration from aviation authorities to certify future hydrogen powered aircraft to airworthiness um, safety standards. Not to mention, of course, government collaboration as a critical piece of the puzzle. And we do welcome in the sense, the support we're receiving from different nations, among which France, Germany, the UK and Spain, plus of course, European Union to fund R&T in this regard. Thank you, Gracia. I, I hear a lot about technology, but every single speaker has also mentioned policy. And so nobody better to speak of that than Secretary of State Shapps and, and how you see policy, public-private partnerships, as well as government initiatives like your Jet Zero Council as we head into COP26 as, as the most impactful COP ever is, is what I'm hearing you say. Please go ahead. That's right. I think it, this really will be the most impactful um, COP ever because um, we have a moment in our history where um, the world is sort of coming together around this policy discussion. And I just, whilst listening to the other speakers there, I was, I was remembering a time when um, Al Gore must have just produced his, uh, his film, An Inconvenient Truth. And we weren't yet in government in the UK. So uh, our, our, we, he came to, to meet the shadow cabinet as we were at the time. Uh, and one of the questions that was thrown to him was, what will happen given that um, you may well persuade the West to pursue these net zero targets in time? And of course, this is now, you know, a decade and a half ago, really. Um, but what are you going to do? Because you'll never get China to go along with that. That was the question. And ironically, China have announced their net zero target uh, of, uh, before 2060, um, before the United States of America. So you ask how important policy is. The policy is everything. Uh, in this, or, or, or certainly a very large chunk. You can't do it without policy. And I think that's why it's encouraging um, that really now, at this moment in time, we have the whole world coming together uh, and, uh, and recognizing how important it is for us to reach those zero carbon um, targets. And uh, America ducked out of this for, 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 for a little while, for the last few years, uh, but it's clearly coming back in a strong way. Um, I know that John Kerry's been um, uh, given the, the, the post of, uh, of the, the climate uh, uh, envoy uh, for COP26. And so there's a he heavyweight approach to dealing with climate starting at a policy level. Um, and uh, my best direct experience of that are twofold. First of all, just in cars uh, and in vehicles, um, the UK has legislated uh, or uh, set a, a target for 2030, more than target, a, a, it will be legislation to rule out uh, any further sales of petrol or diesel vehicles. So that's in 2030, that's in nine years time. And um, similarly, we have this, uh, as I mentioned before, legislative target for 2050 to be net zero. And aviation absolutely has to, one of the more tricky parts of this, it's much easier with the cars. We already have the technology, it's already there. Yeah, I drive an electric car, lots of people will. Planes are different as has been discussed. Uh, but I think that's where things, initiatives like the Jet Zero Council can make a big difference. Once again, it brings together the policy, the academics, the industry, uh, all of the kind of um, the, the best thinkers and doers in this field and brings them all uh, under one roof. And I think in some ways, uh, only the power of uh, government as a convener 
uh, can can help to do that. And of course, sometimes uh, we can help to uh, uh, grease the wheels, or maybe there's a better sort of jet zero uh, <laughs> comparison that I can use in order to, I was going to say put rocket boosters under it, but that would be wrong again, you know, to electrify the process and accelerate it uh, uh, up to uh, up to altitude.